A Tale Told Prelude to Invasion Blood cloaks, my riv rimmed Grimnir, my dauntless warlike champions. The Jotun look to us in Scalan, but we have greater work in the north. We will be the mighty host to the mark, the unyielding storm. Fear no engagement, dare every heroism. The Green Shield, our tireless, triumphant vanguard. We take Tromsa, here, now. Conversion requires common ground. Let's take some. Lofin Bloodcloak, General of the Bloodcloaks. Heroes of the Green Shield, hail to thee. Captains, go to the Bloodcloak. Her war host will walk us to triumph. We go to the vanguard. Blood glistening spears to cut them away. Triumphant charge across the border. Be first amongst a foe. All of the West comes with you. Join us and see, heralds of Janon. Arm in arm to hard won war play come summer swords and elfin shot. To Jarl Olgaf, we have taken this wartime. Shields will be sundered. That war day. That red day now comes early to Tromsa. Iron Osric, General of the Green Shield. The summer storm, the blood cloaks, and the green shield withdraw from Scalan, out of Iron Stand into Semesuak. Back in Wintermark, they join up with four other Imperial armies, and barely missing a beat, launch an overwhelming invasion of Tromsa believed to be the northernmost of the Jotun territories. They're joined by the Strong Reeds, the Tusks and the Bounders, three armies of marchers hunting the fugitive Mathilda Fisher, believed to have taken refuge with the Jarl of Tromsa after her comprehensive defeat in Bregasland. They're also joined by the Fire of the South, the freeborn army making a forced march across the length of the Empire from Caraman. Seven Imperial armies, some 35,000 soldiers from four nations, supported by more than 25,000 warriors fighting as part of elite warbands led by Imperial captains. They're also supported by 10,000 Fey Knights from the Fields of Glory, a splendid rainbow of armoured warriors that glow with inner light, called forth by Imperial magicians. Every army, save the Fire of the South and the Strong Reeds, marches with a contingent of the Summer Heralds, and the Fire of the South have their own allies. Snow-white warriors in coal-black abound, lips and eyes as red as blood, armed with viciously hooked and serrated blades, clanking and whispering with the chains that adorn or bind them, sent by the bound king to aid the bold freeborn. Apparently, the thrice-cursed king appreciated the winter magic the army used in Caraman, and in return for allowing him to slake his hunger in the Brass Coast, he has sent his court to support the Freeborn, just as he has the Dornish and Navarre in the past. The Green Shield and Summer Storm have additional allies. One dark night, shortly before entering Tromsa, a double handful of lithe crimson dancers emerge from the shadows to march alongside the winter folk, and another score or so with the Imperial Orcs. Barely armoured, scarlet skin covered with intricate golden tattoos, they are full of passionate intensity, inspiring their fellow warriors and urging them to embrace the things that rule their hearts. In battle, they are relentless, full of unquenchable energy leaping and spinning through the fray with their short spears. Emissaries of the shadowed fire, there at the behest of the generals. Their presence is not welcomed by the summer knights fighting with those armies, but for the most part they do their best to ignore Janon's chosen. Unfortunately, the unpredictable heralds of the shadowed flame seem to take that as a personal challenge. Seeking opportunities to show up the elfin warriors on the battlefield, or infuriate them when the fighting is over. Shortly before the armies leave Semesuak, one final group of peculiar creatures turn up to join them. A contingent of short metallic creatures that seem to be made of a silvery white metal. 
They present themselves to the commanders of the Imperial forces and say that they have been paid by the Academy of Heroes to fight the Jotun somewhere. They are beings of the Autumn Realm. Three odd little mercenary companies named the Plate Metal Reeves, the Tin Helms, and the Mercury Blades. The commanders are not entirely sure what to make of them, but their intent seems sincere. They are not very strong, certainly no match for any Imperial soldier, but they work well together, perfectly drilled to fight alongside others and follow orders. They are also patently made of tin, which makes them very fragile. They are given roles as runners, although they insist on trying to fight alongside the much larger human and orc soldiers at every turn, in accordance with their contracts. The armies gather in Stark, at the Fortress of Kalant. The presence of so many creatures of the realms alongside the Imperial forces conjures a peculiar atmosphere. There is something almost unreal at times about this campaign under the arching skies at the top of the world. Putting such feelings aside as best they can, once the gathering of forces is complete, Imperial troops cross the southern arm of the Lanspari and drive west into Tromsa. The Green Shield lead the way, charging heroically into the unknown. But each of the other armies strives to match them. Only the fire of the south lag behind a little, tired from their long march north. Into Icewood. Freeborn, we take our fire north, that our passion be at the forefront, that our flame burn bright. One more season of fighting the Jotun. We will fight cleanly, as Freeborn should, joined by the Bound King's knights. We will not execute, we will not attack those retreating, we will not attack the healers. Follow our flame. Velasco y Guerra, General of the Fire of the South. Warriors of the Summer Storm, we have gone into Scalan and heard Shoffin Bitten Blade, now let's go into Tromsa. Let me formally invite the Heralds of Janon on our overwhelming assault. Together we shall free the Thralls and take back their land. We are going into battle with our ancestors and we shall see what Shoffin has to say as we take all we can. Iron Tide Score, General of the Summer Storm. Tromsa is ruled over by Jarl Olga Fanagarsen, an experienced warrior known for his wildness, who heeds only the words of Isra Jansdottir, Queen of Kalesa, and the counsel of his respected rival Ustigar, the aging Jarl of Kirheim. Much like Scalan, he leads six lesser Jarls, each of whom presides over a single region, representing one of the great extended clans of the Western Orcs. It seems they are not expecting 70,000 Imperial soldiers. They have been caught flat-footed by the strategy of the military council, focusing their attention in the south, in Scalan. That is not to say that the territory is defenceless. The Jotun are well known for building forts and castles wherever they go. Yet no castle, not even the Castle of Thorns, not even the unscalable walls of Holberg, can hold off 70,000 troops for long. Not much is known about this cold northern territory, only what little was gleaned during the recent expedition to map the Sea of Snow, and stories of old campaigns against the Jotun have surprisingly little to say about it. There is snow here, even in the height of summer. The land is rugged and wild, broken by hills that rise to mountainous heights in places. There is a particularly impressive peak at the heart of Tromsa, which the thralls say is called Mount Majestind, and claim is the throne of the gods. The rest of the territory is peppered with unwelcoming forests, especially along the eastern borders. One such forest is Icewood, the first region of Tromsa encountered by Imperials, a vast wild land that apparently runs the entire length of the eastern border. Its hills are covered in a cloak of ancient black-barked trees, pine, fir, 
Beggar Wood and Spruce. They have few roads. This poses a challenge in itself, as do the predatory dire beasts that lurk in the depths of the forests. They mostly flee before larger groups of soldiers, but smaller parties of scouts sometimes find themselves in dreadful life or death struggles with dire wolves, a behemoth ice bear, or even stranger creatures. There's also the problem of the cold. Even though the summer solstice is barely past, the weather is bitter. The fire of the south in particular feel the bite of the chill winds blowing down out of Sidania, but even the winter folk are a little unprepared for just how sharp the fangs of these icy winds prove to be. There are Jotun here, mostly thralls in scattered villages who hunt the beasts of the forest, including the immense dark hide dire elk, or gather ambergelt and dragon bone from among the trees. As with Scalan, they mostly flee when they encounter Imperial soldiers. The overwhelming majority are orcs. There appear to be very few human thralls in the Icewood. They are subjects of Yarbjörnda Bear Crusher, a doughty Jotun who it is said once crushed an ice bear's head with her bare hands, and her warriors are quick to respond to the Imperial invasion. Bands of Ulfur begin to probe the Empire's forces, avoiding direct conflict, reporting back to their mistress and marking the progress of the Empire. Cunning Bear Crusher abandons her hall, rallying her warriors and as many of her thralls as she can, and retreating westward once the sheer size of the Imperial forces massed against them is clear. Icewood is claimed by the Empire within a handful of weeks although the depths of the forest remain just as unknown as they were before. There is one particularly notable encounter in the north. A band of bloodcloaks following a trail, seemingly left by thralls fleeing a nearby settlement, enter an area of the forest where the firs and pines are all marked with unfamiliar glyphs. These angular sigils are cut deep into the bark and the trees are adorned with wood and bone tokens carved with the runes Hermok, Irimaeus, and Weir. They have not progressed far when a quartet of massive humanoid beings, seemingly built of animal bones, bound together with leather thongs and surmounted with the horned skulls of immense aurochs, elk, and moose, emerge suddenly from the shadows. Their eyes burn with a dull blue fire, and between them walks an orc woman wearing an eyeless bird mask and a feathered mantle. She warns the winter folk that they are trespassing, not on the lands of Yarbjörnda, but into the domain of Fixuvaris, Ralyost's guide, a domain where they are not welcome. An ice walker with the scouts determines that this area of the forest belongs to or has been claimed by wise Rangara and if the armies want to claim it, they will need to fight the Eternal to do so. The scouts wisely withdraw, leaving the decision of what to do about this place to someone else. This place appears to be one of those peculiar embassies the Jotun maintain to the magical realms. Places imperial spies have seen in Hordland, and whose existence inspired the creation of fanes in the Empire. At this time, wise Rangara seems disinclined to interfere in the conquest of the Icewood. So the decision is made to leave a small force of a hundred soldiers behind to keep an eye on the rune-marked woods, and to continue the invasion of Tromsø. It is a difficult decision, though, especially given the dangers posed by Estevus's fame in the recent campaign in Scalan. Skyfall From the Icewood, the Imperial forces divide, pressing westward. The Marcher armies and the Fire of the South emerge from the forest in the south, while the Imperial Orcs and the Winterfolk leave the woods to the northwest, emerging onto a storm-swept tundra. These are the Skyfall Wastes, according to the Thralls. No trees grow here, and if anything they are even more sparsely settled than the Icewood. At night, the northern lights are clearly visible in the clear skies, and barely a month after the height of summer, it is normal to awaken to a frost on the ground and flurries of snow. All the orcs encountered wear sigils, marked with the rune Diras, which they grudgingly explain hides them from the attention of the twisting ribbons of ice 
and from the wicked spirits that sometimes come down from the north with the howling winds. Travel far enough across the skyfall wastes, and one finds Deskiru and the endless storm of Sidania. Jarl Hoden Hodenson has a lightly fortified hall built atop an artificial mound in the southern part of the region. Considered something of a mystic in Jotun terms, Hodenson's warriors are no match for the Empire, but fight desperately to try and stem the Imperial advance. They know the tundra well and use that to their advantage, but they are massively overmatched, and Hoden's hall swiftly falls. Hoden echoes Jarl Bjornder. He and his champions retreat west. Skyfall is conquered. This area includes Lake Karnakadatha, a massive body of water similar to those found in Semesuak, that lies on the border between the Skyfall Wastes and Tesirku. The waters here are significantly warmer than those in the rest of the region, and numerous small settlements dot its shores. The main industry here is fishing, but that is not the reason Jarl Hodenson maintains several watchtowers and a force of warriors here. The lake was apparently formed long ages past, when the northern lights apparently caused a fragment of star to fall and destroy the castle of a prideful Jarl. Star metal is commonly pulled from the depths of the lake, or found in the bellies of fish. Some of these fish are apparently very odd indeed. Both strange fish and star metal are sent south, to be used by the Jotun smiths, and are apparently the main reason Skyfall is settled at all. Rixgog and the Battle of Biel Tervathorn. Reeds, folk heroes of Bregasland, we have shown the fire that burns in our hearts and run the Jotun and Fisher out of Bregasland. But do we stop there? Do we rest on our laurels? Of course not. We will take up the chase and march into their land. See how they fucking like it. March with me, friends. Loyalty calls us to drag Mathilda Fisher from her hole. Amberlane P. Black, General of the Strong Reeds. Jacks of the Tusk, we march on Tromsa to take the war to Jotun homelands. Bring all your virtue to bear as we take away their means to wage war. They say Fisher is hiding here. Leave no ground to go to. Stanley of Chalkdown, General of the Tusks. Marchers, I march as your general one last time. Infused with the power of summer, we take the war to the Jotun and hated Mathilda Fisher, should she be found. Tonight we strike. There is thunder in the sky. Together we fight. Some of us will die. They'll always remember how we made a stand, and many will die by our hand. Cyphus Blackjack Dekar, General of the Bounders. West of Icewood. South of Skyfall lie the lands of Jarl Clara Sembansian. Heavily forested in the east, the region becomes flatter and more open as one travels westward. The first actual farms are encountered, if you can call them as such. The marchers scoff at the hard scrabble life that amounts to agriculture here. The soil is hard and cold. Most of the thralls focused on raising herd animals rather than trying to grow crops. There are also a large number of burial mounds here, noticeably more than the Imperial armies have encountered elsewhere in Scalan or Tromsø. The thralls barely cooperate with the Imperial soldiers, but share a few stories of the long ago battles between the Jarls of Scalan and Tromsø. It seems these two territories have not always been so closely allied although the stories strongly imply that these conflicts ended before the fall of Terennial. These ancient battles may explain the presence of Fjelta Vathorn, 
The hall of Yar Riskog is a heavily fortified tower surrounded by a small town. The largest settlement the invaders have encountered so far, it is also the site of the first organised resistance against the Imperial armies. Jarl Clara Sembansian leads the defence of Riskog themselves. Warned by Jarl Bjorn's Ulfer, they also have an unexpected ally. More than a thousand Jagara, many with pike and pole arm, are camped around Vielt of Athorn. There had been stories that when they were driven out of Bregislan, the fishers of Fisher's Rock did not return to their lands in Hordland, but fled north. Rumour suggests that the Jarl of Tromsa owed his life to Mathilda Fisher, and that the would-be steward of the Bregus has fled back to his lands. The fact that Mathilda's presence has brought the angry marcher armies down on Tromsa is not likely to be overlooked. The first actual battle takes place on the plains before the town. Jotun and Yagara clashing with Marcher and Freeborn. Additional reinforcements begin to arrive from further west, led by Jarl Olgaf Anagarsen himself. Several thousand Jotun with a vanguard of heavily armoured Skaldir at their head. A siege is laid, and for a very short time, it looks as if the Empire's advance might end here. Unfortunately for the Jotun, two days after the first clash, the rest of the Imperial armies arrive from the north. News of the Jotun forces reaches the ears of the Calavasi among the Wintermark armies, and with Skyfall waste secured, they crash against the flanks of the Jotun defenders. The Vielta Vathen falls before the Imperial hammer. Jarls Olgaf and Clara try to hold the gates of the tower themselves, buying time for their forces to retreat. And when the rubble of the shattered fortification is searched, their bodies are found back to back, buried in the broken stone. At first, there are wild rumours that Mathilda Fisher perished alongside her ally. More than a dozen marchers describe seeing her struck down by a blow from a bill that shattered ribs and spilled her bowels to the floor. It certainly sounds like a fatal blow, but there is no sign of her body among the fallen, nor can anyone identify who actually landed the fatal blow. With or without Mathilda, the remaining fishers retreat alongside their Jotun allies, and as soon as the last Jotun resistance is crushed, the Empire's armies follow suit with the Bounders leading the way. The self-styled Steward of Bregathland will not escape Marcher Justice again. Tromsdalen and the Battle of Oxenesfestal West of Rixgog lies Tromsdalen, and another Jotun fortification. The region itself is rough and hilly, with perpetually snow-clapped and cloud-wrapped mountains to the east. The region is nestled between these high peaks and the great Mount Majarstin that lies at the centre of Tromsa. The mountains of Tromsdalen are part of the same range as a Yarfell, and on their eastern edge stands Oxenesfestal, a commanding fortification that also served as the seat of the Jarl of Tromsa himself before his death. The castle is massive, a match for the Castle of Thorns in Astolat, although there are signs that it has been expanded to its current size only within the last few years. More importantly, perhaps, there are signs that the structure is reinforced with adamant the same almost indestructible stone of the Summer Realm used in the construction of the Adamant Gate in Semahome, or the Court of the White Fountain in Redoubt. Three high towers surmount a massive curtain wall, the highest fashioned after the horned head of a massive aurochs. Serpentine dragons coil around the other two towers, giving a strong indication that this fort has been constructed at least in part with the aid of the Stone King. The Jotun make a stand here, in the shadow of the mountains. It seems that the castle is under the command of Egya Olgafsdottir, who has some experience of dealing with Imperial armies, and is by all accounts well beloved by both the King under the mountain and the Queen of Ice and Darkness. The surviving Jarls of the conquered regions, or their heirs, gather here, 
reinforcing the garrison of the Oxenesfestsal. Their banners hanging from the walls alongside those of Tromsa and the bull skull banners of Skjaldir, that popular Fadir who epitomises the tenacity of the Jotun people. Yet alongside the red and white banners of the Jotun hangs one single blue banner, the banner of the Fishers of Fishers Rock. The marchers prepare to assault the castle. The walls of Oxenesfestsal repel assault after assault. Jotun and Imperial troops alike falling left and right. As the autumn equinox approaches, it becomes more and more obvious that the Empire's momentum has faltered, absorbed by the adamant walls of the Jotun castle and its tenacious defenders. Yet there can be little doubt that momentum has carried Imperial soldiers further than any Jotun might have imagined in their wildest dreams, and seen them camped before the walls of the Jarl of Tromsa's own throne. Heroism honour, and cruelty. As always, the armies of Wintermark particularly fight heroically, seeking to defeat their opponents rather than slaughter them. This is obvious to all the Jotun they face, and it appears that this attitude is being reciprocated. During the battles of Vieltavathorn and Oxenesfestal, it is clear that the Jotun engaged with the people of Wintermark honourably, holding back from killing where they did not need to, honouring their Winterfolk opponents. Despite this, some 1,500 Imperial soldiers die in the invasion of Tromsa. The Jotun have suffered significantly more serious casualties. The entire garrison of Vieltavathorn, many of the warriors of Icewood, Skyfall Waste and Rixgog, and a large number of soldiers defending the walls of Oxenesfestsal. Not everyone shows the honourable restraint of the Jotun and the Winterfolk. The General of the Fire of the South has instructed the freeborn soldiers that we will not execute, we will not attack those retreating, we will not attack the healers. This may be a reaction to the violence unleashed by the influence of the Winter Enchantment that influenced them in Karaman. Unfortunately, perhaps, the warrior knights of Tharium broadly ignore this instruction. They don't risk imperial lives to do so, but they relish opportunities to cut down those attempting to flee and will execute fallen opponents unless a freeborn captain is present to ensure that they do not. They take great pleasure in singling out healers too, striking them down with icy cold blades and chain bound maces. Whatever else has happened, it has become clear that Tromsa is a peculiar territory. Perhaps it is due to its presence on the edge of Tsirku. Perhaps it is something else. The Imperial Orcs speak of something being in the air here. Those who feel a connection to warlike ancestors apparently find the voices clearer during the campaign into Tromsa. Those who can hear Sjofin of the Bitten Blade in particular report that it is even easier for them to hear the distant voice of that Jotun ancestor, urging them to fight heroically, gloriously, and revel in the clash of steel on the battlefield. Perhaps this is due to some spiritual or magical quality of the territory, or perhaps it is merely a symptom of the way the Imperial Orcs are internalising the lessons of the Alarum. Another mystery, one that must wait until the fighting is done. For while the Empire has done well, the fighting is very far from over. Mathilda Fisher is unaccounted for. Three thirds have formed, made up of the defenders of Icewood, Skyfall Waste and Rixgog. They rally to the west. The Jarl of Tromsa may have fallen along with Vieltavathan, but his daughter stands ready to take his place and she is much more familiar with the heroes and the soldiers of the Empire than her father, and much angrier with those who slew him. More pressingly, there is news of an immense force of Jotun, including all of the armies of Kalisa, having reached Scalan. They have recaptured all the territory claimed by the Empire last season, and are ready to march north into Tromsa, 
or perhaps launch their own raid into Semesuak. Either way, they might in theory cut off the Imperial retreat. The armies are a long way from the borders of Wintermark. If the Jotun force can take Rixgog, Imperial armies would need to fight their way back through them to reach Imperial territory. For now, though, the world catches its breath. But any moment now, the chaos of the fray will erupt once again, here in the north, beneath the cold, charcoal sky. Game Information The Empire does not have a map of Tromsa. Soldiers on the ground cobble together a very rough approximation of where some of the things they have seen are in relation to one another, but nothing more. They are reasonably confident that there are seven regions in total, of which they have seen four. The Empire has captured three of the presumably seven regions of Tromsa. Icewood, which has the forested quality and is the only region in the territory that borders Semesuak. Skyfall Waste, which apparently has the sky-haunted quality, reflecting the proximity of the Northern Lights, and Rixgog. They are one-tenth of the way toward capturing Tromsdalen, which has the hills quality. The latter two regions border Scalan to the south, as does Icewood. During the invasion of Tromsa, it is clear that the Jotun are engaging with the people of Wintermark differently to the soldiers of other nations. As with the Winterfolk themselves, they seek opportunities to fight rather than kill their enemies, extending quarter and acting honourably or heroically. As such, all casualties taken by the Wintermark armies are reduced by a tenth. This effect continues as long as the Winterfolk continue to fight honourably. In the process of capturing Rixgog, the Empire destroyed Viel Tavathon, a rank 1 fortification, and inflicted significant damage on Oxenesfetsal, a rank 3 fortification with the unbreakable quality, which means that like the Adamant Gate, it cannot fall below 1000 strength. It can be captured, but not destroyed by mortal means. In Skyfall Waste, the Empire has captured an Ilium source. Lake Karnakadatha could be allocated by the Imperial Senate. It is not clear how much Ilium the lake provides each season, and actually claiming any of that production would rely on the Empire continuing to hold the region. The Empire appears to have captured a fane dedicated to Wise Rangara in northern Icewood. A small contingent of Imperial troops are watching over the fane but there is no sign that anything threatening is going on there. Certainly no sign that Wise Rangara is minded to send out heralds to support the Jotun. Participation. Military units. Any character whose military unit was assigned to fight alongside the Green Shield or the Summer Storm this downtime may choose to have been impacted by the experience of battling in close proximity to large numbers of heralds of Elianaris and inspired by the emissaries of Janon. Any character whose military unit supported one of these two armies may choose to gain a single temporary hero point, even if they do not have the hero skill. Once spent, this additional point is permanently gone, and will have faded entirely by the end of the Autumn Equinox regardless. If you choose to claim this benefit, however, you also experience a powerful role-playing effect. You feel driven to take action, especially in pursuit or defence of the things you care for most. Whether a person or an ideal, it is easy for you to act without thinking when you feel that thing is in danger, or when an opportunity to support it presents itself. This role-playing effect is particularly strong for anyone who already has the Changeling or Naga lineage. Battle Opportunity Shortly before the equinox, horns are sounded and a parley called by the defenders of Oxenesfestal, who wish to meet with the commanders of the armies of Wintermark and representatives of the marches. A small group of Jotun and Yagara meet representatives of the Empire atop a battle-scarred hill within bowshot of both armies. 
Igya Olga's daughter herself, now Jarl of Tromsø, leads the Jotun contingent. Flanked by heavily armoured Skaldir, she is accompanied by a single Yagara in the blue livery of the fishers. She addresses most of her comments to the Winterfolk, but acknowledges the marcher commanders. What is discussed here is not currently public knowledge, but the prognosticators have divined a major conjunction of the Sentinel Gate leading to Trom's Dalen during the autumn equinox that is surely connected to the matter of the parley. Further information will no doubt be available before the equinox.